You're listening to Driving Law, a podcast by Kyla Lee about all things related to the rules of the road. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Driving Law Podcast. I am Kyla Lee, and with me, as usual, is Paul Doroshenko. Hello. How are you doing? I'm well and good. This is our election special, 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 election special podcast. Sure. I mean, I think I am suffering from election fatigue. Me too. It's a hard place for me to be in, though, because although I'm completely fatigued by this election... I am in the midst of just beginning my campaign for my own election. So people are probably just tired of elections, yeah. and now you're running and now to I'm be like, vote for me. bencher of the Law Society of British Columbia for the Vancouver region. Yeah, and I think I'm going to take some like campaigning cues from um, all of the political parties. I'm going to post pictures of my parents on my camp- venture campaign plane. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Good. Will you have two airplanes yeah. or one? Uh, just one. I don't okay. have that big of an entourage. Now, do we have any um, any photographs of you doing anything really, really racist? inappropriate or <laughs> racist in your no. in your history? No. Okay. No. Um, and there is a. Are you an American citizen? I wish. Are you, or have you ever been an American? <laughs> no, but I did. I think one very drunken Fourth of July many many years ago find an American in a bar in Vancouver and I was dressed in like my head to toe. This was in the Obama days, okay. In my head to toe like America outfit and begged them to marry me. <laughs> well, um, those would have been in your days back when you were a drinker. Yes. And yes. you're not anymore. No. And because you are no longer a drinker, uh, I would be comfortable in voting for you to be Bencher of the Law Society. In fact, I... You, know. you would have done it even if I still could drink. That's true. You're good, you're balanced, you're smart, and uh, youthful and energetic. Yes. So, um, all those things. All the lawyers who are out there, you know, the biggest problem, I think, is uh, apathy. People don't vote. Yeah. Um, and statistically, if you look at it, um, last year in the Bencher by election, it was an 18% turnout of Just eligible awful. voters. The by election before that, the first time I ran, there was a 15% turnout. And the last general election two years ago, the voter turnout was 28% of this all eligible really This is really not impressive. We're talking no. about lawyers, lawyers being engaged in the democratic process of their yeah. own law society. I mean, come on, and get out there and vote. It's not even like voting in the federal election where you have to... Go out I in the recall, rain. Go out and stand in a goddamn lineup with people who bring their kids to the polling station and then don't control their kids. There was no and, line when I went in and voted. Well, there was a line when I went last time. And there were children running around and one ran into me and the mom didn't even say anything. And it was just a horrendous experience all around. And it That's made the me great sick. unwashed masses. It made Those me are... feel sick about my strategic vote. Those are humans out there just being humans. Yeah, maybe. And but exercising their franchise, going out there and voting. And you look, shouldn't be so negative about it, I'm particularly when about you it. I'm are about running. Bad parenting. You are running. Yeah, I know. You, so you have a different issue. It's mm-hmm. not the election, it's not the voting. I wouldn't have you to are asking, that. You're asking for people to cast their ballot for yes. you, Kyla. So and the, you know what? let's they get can... positive about it. What happens yes, if they me, have kids? Let hmm? me tell you the positives. If they have children, if you have a very busy practice, if you work a really ridiculous schedule, or maybe you're on the road a lot because your your lawyering takes you from town to town throughout British Columbia or Canada. You're looking at your fingernails. You're already tuned out. Um, the uh, If any of those things apply to you, it does not matter because unlike the federal election, you have a whole two weeks, November 1st to November 15th, during which you can vote and... You can vote on the internet at your own convenience. You can vote while you're on the toilet. So, young you lawyers. Have no excuse, Law Society lawyers, members. Young lawyers, get out there and vote because it is important. And if you have never thought about how important it is, take a look at Ontario. Yeah. Because, um, you know, the Law Society can do a lot of damage if you get some people in there who are um, problematic. 
Yes. Um, you don't, don't want a you don't want a uh, slate of candidates to end up with, uh, and and I don't see that happening no, in BC with say, the I looked with at the, the list of the candidates. The people but... the people that are running against me in Vancouver County are either already benchers, um, which makes it harder for me. So I really do need your votes if you're listening. It matters. Your vote counts when only twenty eight percent of lawyers eligible lawyers in the province vote, and you're voting in 11 candidates and there are uh, uh, 17 running in that county where I'm running, your vote really does matter. Absolutely. And one or two votes does make a difference. Well, and the other thing is it is, uh, it's not the same, you know, it's not like a federal election where you you vote for the um, candidate that doesn't have a chance in some cases because you think you're doing the ethical thing. In this case, every ballot actually does matter. Yeah, and they're weighted ballots, They're weighted too. ballots. So, so you can have your whole electoral reform dreams come true in the Law Society general election. And demonstrate for the rest of Canada how well it works. Yeah, sure, if that's something you're into. Now, the other thing I will say about... I'm going to remind people next time on the Driving Law podcast and next time until the election to get out and vote for Kyla Lee. In our election special, okay, no problem, but I'm going to do it again. Go ahead. Come. I'm going to remind them. I'm begging for your vote. What do you want? What issues are important to you? Tell me. I have an opinion on pretty much like everything except the pipeline. A well-developed opinion on probably 40% of things and an opinion on everything. Yeah, exactly. No. Except the pipeline. Literally no opinion on that. I have a full-on pipeline opinion. I know you do. I just don't have time to come up with a pipeline opinion. It's, it's an opinion I'd have to have well-developed and that's a lot of research. Well, my opinion is that I, in many areas of um, concern, I defer to experts. Except you have conflicting experts, Paul. How could you be a judge in this circumstance? Defer to the experts? What if you have conflicting experts? Well, I wouldn't take the expert just because their um, use of English is better than the other expert, or I wouldn't reject an expert just because they didn't use the... Uh, customary plurals or something like that mm -hmm. um the um and, and this is and why many we people need probably know what i'm referring to in I know. the law society i know and you're ventures. metis so we should I'm have metis, a, a i'm a woman i'm a younger lawyer you know what the the, the female yeah. issue in the in yeah. the law society might be an issue but like no. on the bench it's a 50 50 split in fact if you look at the retention numbers for the law society of british columbia and oh, for retention for of retention members, yeah, of that's members. a big problem. Um, and you look at people who are in their first year uh, to five years of practice, women outnumber men. Once you get to the 15-year mark, that turns around. And Women the, are smart enough to quit. No. <clears throat> there is a reason that women are leaving the profession in droves. There's many reasons, actually. Some of them have to do with not being able to deal with the demands of, uh, of a practice while they have the demands of everything that women are expected to do in the home. But lots has to do with uh, difficulties that women face in this profession. I mean, I've had my own experiences. A lawyer who shall not be named said the most sexist thing imaginable to me in the hallway of a courthouse in front of a you female article You could imagine much more sexist things than that. Okay, it, well, was, it, was, it, was it was bad. Bad and stupid and deserved an apology. Yeah, and when I called him but out on it, he doubled down on it and repeated the sexist comment But he's not a member face. anymore, so he's gone. He's a retired member. And that's the thing. All lawyers... He's a retired member and he has a vote, but he's voting in Victoria County and their candidate, uh, Pinder Chima, was acclaimed, so he can't vote against me. There you go. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, my point is that they all die, Kyla. So if you have any enemies right. out there in the world, if there's a <laughs> judges or, or, uh, lawyers or whoever, if somebody hates me and I'm their enemy, don't worry. Eventually I'll die. Or they'll die. Well, we'll all die. So it's the great equalizer. There's no proof of that yet. There, there's plenty of proof of that yet. So I guess you're in the climate no change proof. denial category. You'll die and there's no proof I'll die. There's... I, I'm confident. Of, I'm not dead well, yet. I'm confident of both of those. Nobody's proved that I'm dead. Yeah. Well, okay. You're trolling. You're a troll <laughs> yeah, I'm now. Trolling. now. I see you're I'm an trolling my troll. own podcast. Okay. Um, but. On to uh, driving law. On to driving law. And as uh, we pulled up to our uh, recording studio this evening, it was dark 
it was rainy, it was hard to see the lines on the road, it was hard to see the lights of other cars because the ringing on the windshield made them all smear. Kind of it, guessing, guessing where you yeah. are on the road as and you're like, driving. When you're making a turn, are you sure there's not a pedestrian there? Not a hundred percent. Oh, I know. And especially if the pedestrian's dressed in a darker color or they're behind the pillar at some point and, and then they're out from the pillar. we all love our dark fall colors. I know. Well, of course, they look great. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, what does this mean? What is this awful driving condition weather that we're stuck with now basically until spring? What does that mean? Well, I mean, typically you and I see the spike in hit and runs. Mm-hmm. And uh, the spike in hit and runs happen for lots of reasons. Um, the, you know, but it really is weather related that the accidents occur. And when the accidents occur, people are so uh, shocked at the fact that it happened. Um, and then for the myriad of other reasons, they often don't stop. Yes. Because either they're impaired or they're panicked or they're prohibited or they think they might be impaired even though they're not. They had a cannabis edible the day before and they're worried there's still THC in their system. Hundreds of reasons. They're driving the vehicle. They're not supposed to be driving. They're somewhere where they're not supposed to be at the time. Or they're supposed to be driving the vehicle but they don't understand how it's going to impact their mother's insurance so they take off. Don't worry, it'll only impact you now. Um, So for all sorts of reasons, people leave the scene of accidents. And um, the, um, so we end up with lots of hit and run cases at this time of the year, and they usually start with investigations. And so I think for the purpose of discussing the spike in it today, we should probably talk about what, you know, if you've stumbled upon this podcast and you've just left the scene of an accident... (laughs) Um, the, um, you know, take a deep breath and, uh, you're going to have to speak to a lawyer and you're going to have to speak to a lawyer right away because the, there's quite a bit that a lawyer can do for you. Now, does it make a difference, Paul? And and I know you're like basically an expert in handling hit and run investigations. Does it make a difference what you hit? Oh, of course. Yeah. You know that. And I know you're asking me that for the the sake of it. Yes. Thank you. (laughs) Um, well, if you hit a car or a person, or cattle, and cattle has been broadly defined and would probably also include a herd of sheep or a horse. Maybe but not a dog. Not a dog, yeah. Um, but if you, uh, livestock, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw a deer today just eating somebody's hedge, and that would not count. But if you hit a car, a person, a vehicle, a person, or cattle, livestock, uh, then you are potentially facing a criminal uh, charge and, and possibly a criminal conviction because those are the uh, ones for which there's a criminal charge. If you do property damage, if you, you know, take out somebody's sapling or a fence and you leave the scene, you're not facing a criminal charge. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're facing potentially a Motor Vehicle Act charge uh, if you don't take steps to contact the owner and figure out, you know, who you need to notify, uh, but you don't have to all, uh, also sit there all day uh, until somebody comes along and says, that's my sapling. And sit there next to a city of Vancouver tree and go, well, eventually there'll be a bylaw officer just happening upon here. So people take out posts and things like that, and they really don't know what to do in those circumstances. When I was learning to drive, I guess I still had my N, and I was in my uncle's driveway. I'd been hanging out with my cousin that afternoon and I had to go home and backed my car up to try and get out. I took out his water spout and I was like, oh shit, I don't know what to do. So I just drove away and as I drove away, I saw him in the window. He totally saw me. Thankfully, he didn't call the police. Cause... I was surprised he didn't chase it after you with a pitchfork. <laughs> no, he just Knowing your family. Me. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, he just teased me. In any event, if you um, do commit a hit and run, you should know that uh, anything you say to the police is evidence. Um, so this would be a situation where you would want to use your trademarked line. Lawyer told me not to talk to you. But before you even get to the point of having to talk to the police, your best bet is to talk to a lawyer right away. And the reason for that is the one most powerful thing I think we have as a lawyer, and that is that um, 
anything that we say to the police is not going to be used as evidence against you. So we can, we can speak to the police. Remember, lawyers, criminal defense lawyers, are the only people who are written into the Charter of Rights. We're the, we are the lawyers in the Constitution you are entitled to have. Um, but um, by virtue of, of our special relationship we have as lawyers to our clients, anything that you say to us uh, is, is privileged and cannot be used against you. We can never be compelled to be a witness against you. And therefore, we can talk to the police about the incident and, and engage with them and have a discussion often to resolve the thing long before you ever have to face the police, long before you ever get into the circumstance of having to sit there and say, lawyer told me not to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Now, does your approach as a lawyer dealing with these differ if you are um, dealing with a case involving a cattle or a person or another vehicle versus property damage? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, if there's somebody who's injured, I mean, there's there's... Sometimes there's the hit and run where the person has been bumped with a mirror yeah. and the driver arguably has no idea that he hit somebody. And there's other times where people have hit uh, a person, a vehicle has hit a person, and the, the driver doesn't know they've hit a person. That happens. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, any time there's an injury. There are also times, though, where you have, you know, an imprint of a butt and a, a chunk of hair and scalp in your windshield. Sure, I know. There are those occasions and the person continues tooling down the road. Um, the, uh, but of course, anytime there's an injury, um, so if there's an, a car accident with an injury or, a, particularly a pedestrian, um, it's obviously elevated and it's a, it's a different circumstance and, and you're approaching it very differently as a lawyer. And that's because even if you hit a person or you hit a, another vehicle or you hit a cow, um, even if that happens, the police can still choose not to forward criminal charges and they can just give you a, a traffic ticket. That, that's an option that they have and that is prosecutorial discretion that the police have. And the, um, the thing is the police will put in a lot of resources uh, in investigating a hit and run if there's a pedestrian, particularly if there's a pedestrian injured and they think that they can keep digging, that they can get the evidence that they need to found a criminal charge and ultimately a criminal conviction. Um, it, you know, ideally what you want to do is you want to try and find some, some way of resolving that for your client to make sure that they're not going to end up with that criminal charge. Now, Occasionally, go ahead. Oh, no, you finish, finish your thought. Occasionally you want to resolve that with something under another piece of legislation like the Motor Vehicle Act. Now, I was watching an episode of Suits, and this was the last time I watched Suits because I ended up screaming at the TV and throwing things. Um, and Mike, the fake lawyer in the show, uh, is representing a client who's charged with a hit and run. And their strategy for dealing with it was to tell the guy on the phone to go down to the police station and turn himself in immediately so as to mitigate any further damage. And that would be foolhardy. <laughs> Um, I, I can tell you that there's been one time I had a client who wanted to go in and provide a statement and desperately wanted to go in and provide a statement. And, uh, myself and the other lawyer involved in the file, we did everything we could to dissuade this person, to discourage them from doing this, but man, oh man, wanted to provide a statement. And, you know, okay, we take instructions from the client. We, we advise our client, but our client is ultimately the one in the driver's seat, um, we're whispering and he to was them. at the time too. Well, <laughs> um, and, uh, turned my client in and my client gave a full statement and then this was a rare occasion. So you should also know difference from American law and what's on TV and Canadian law is that you don't get to sit there as the lawyer, nope. um, when, uh, your client's giving a statement. The, uh, I remember watching, God, what film was it? I want to say Bob Roberts. No, it was another one with, um with the same actor. I'll find it. Um, sure. I have no idea. Tim Robbins. It's a Tim Robbins film where he's a producer in, uh, he's a producer in LA. We'll find it before the end of the podcast. Um, and, uh, in that case, the defense lawyer goes in and there's a, there's a line up and he ends up escaping responsibility for whatever it was. It might even have been a hit and run or he killed somebody or something. Anyway, um, been a long time, 25 years since I watched the film, but or more. 
Um, the important thing is in Canada, no, the lawyer doesn't go in. But I went in on this time. Oh. And they, the police allowed me to sit in there for the entire interview. And Did there's been times there I have. you with your head in your hands? Oh, it was painful. Well, there have been times when, you know, I've got my clients going in there and we've got an agreement that my client's giving a statement and they're going to be charged under the Motor Vehicle Act as the registered owner and the police just don't want him to be able to come back and, and dispute that ticket once we've made a deal. Yes. So that's why we've agreed for my client to make a statement. And in those cases, fine. You're sitting there, fine, whatever. This person wanted to turn themselves in, wanted to give the false statement. I sat there cringing the entire time because I thought, there's a number of things I considered. I thought, he's probably not telling us the full truth. He's probably planning on telling the police a bit of a story. Did everything to explain that to the client. Ultimately, there was things that were left out to sort of mitigate the damage for himself, to make himself look better or mm -hmm. herself in this case. It didn't, doesn't really matter. Um, and in the end, you know, charges were laid. Every possible charge that could have been laid was laid. Mm -hmm. um, and every possible charge that could have been proven was, you know, no defense. There was no defense. Yeah, I mean, there's no argument that he, uh, his statement was made in violation of his right to counsel or, un, you know, without being voluntary. He's sitting there with his lawyer next to him. There was nothing. There was absolutely Hand nothing. Hand the police the evidence against you on a silver platter. That's uh, the was, stupidest thing you could nothing. do. So we could not negotiate anything. We had no negotiating position. All the tools of our toolbox had been like dumped out on the floor. And basically in the end, there was just some shredded newspaper there. Well, um, it's a really great mitigating factor on sentence. Yeah. And that was the thing. So we were sitting there thinking to ourselves, what brownie points are you going to get on sentence? Nothing really. Nothing. You're still going to go end, to jail if you hurt someone. Well, I ended up convicted of, of uh, uh, more offenses than would have been mm -hmm. uh, without the statement. Um, and... Um, if anything, you know, there was just nothing. There was nothing. We couldn't negotiate out a sentencing position. Um, and the judge gave very little credit to the person turning themselves in. Um, sure, so in the end. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what you're supposed that's to what's do. expected. Exactly. So, don't do uh, it. Call a lawyer. Call a lawyer first. Listen and, to your lawyer. Sure. And see what your lawyer can do. Um, you know, the um, not every case are you going to be able to turn it around and make it perfect. Uh, lots of times, you know, People want to take responsibility and that's fine. You can deal with that too. Taking responsibility. I think for a lot of people, when they hear the term taking responsibility, they think of, you know, being punished by their parents. And in the justice system, taking responsibility can look like a lot of different things. You can take responsibility without going in and saying, I'm guilty of these 10 offenses and here's what happened. And now... Hand me my punishment. I'll take what you give me. I deserve it. There are other ways to take responsibility and to make reparations for the harm that you've caused. The upsetting thing in this case was that the client was likely truthful. And as I said a minute ago, there were statements the client made that were um, to try and minimize um, sort of the culpability of it. Uh, and in the end, the judge looked at the statement that was made and the Crown argued that the minimizing culpability uh, statements were um, deceptive and uh, indicated a sort of weak character. And what? yeah, and the judge bought into that uh, oh at the God. sentencing and, and said, you know what, these, these statements to try and sure you went in to turn yourself in, but you did everything you could to minimize your, your involvement in it or your, you know, how it happened to you, every excuse possible. Wow. And uh, there wasn't really every excuse possible. It was really sort of nitpicking the evidence. And that's an ongoing problem that, you know, we have in the justice system is assessments of evidence. Is, assessing evidence is hard. And, yeah. you know, we do it on the basis of uh, uh, the look in the eye. And we're getting, you know, we make mistakes as a consequence. 54% of the time we're correct or something like that. Okay. All right, so um, back to our hypothetical listener who's just committed a hit and run. Step one, call the police. Or what your do you friend. do with your car? Well, the other thing is don't, um, first of all, don't go running and hiding. It. Don't go running and hiding evidence. Okay. So don't repair the car or wash off the blood or. The moment you regain your senses, phone a lawyer. Um, that's the very first thing that you do. Don't answer the door. 
just don't answer the door. If somebody's banging on your door, don't answer the door. Phone a lawyer, okay? Um, They're not going to get a warrant to arrest you that quickly. No. Um, the next day, uh, don't talk to your family or friends because they can be witnesses. Uh, I've had occasions where people talk to somebody who was connected to the police officer who was investigated into it. Oh, I know that officer. I'll phone him up. Mm -hmm. We'll probably... You know, none of your family or friends have that protection that a lawyer has, and all of your family and friends can be called to testify against you. Remember, if you look at the case right now, not driving law related, but the murder of Kieran Desi, uh, her alleged murderer just granted bail today, his mother also charged as an accessory after the fact because of her alleged involvement in helping him cover up what he'd done. So aside from the fact that all your family... And friends, anybody you talk to, um, can be witnesses against you. Not only that, they can all end up being charged as an accessory to the offense that you committed there for also, hiding it. And there are also charges that they can get if they give false statements in the course of dealing, for example, with ICBC. Oh, I was driving my car that night. Or, oh, my car got stolen. That's a pretty common one. Um, people want to... Uh, Say their car was stolen. Obviously, that's a, one of the big lies that uh, unfolds very quickly every time. Yeah. It never works. I guarantee you, if you committed a hit and run and you think you're going to report your car stolen, the police, as soon as there's a hit and run, they're looking for stolen car reports and they're matching them up. Oh, right away. Right away. Right away. That's yeah. the, as soon as you report that car stolen, they know that you've lied. Um, the, uh, the hit and run driver who's driving in a stolen car is probably one out of a hundred hit and runs. So on pure odds basis, they know that you're the one who is likely the driver at that point. And also Proving it is a different thing though. Yes. Proving it is a different thing. The police can know a lot. Yeah. Uh, but not be able to prove it. So they may be in their own minds, a hundred percent certain you were the driver. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they've got the evidence to prove that you were the driver, which is, again, back to where your lawyer is going to come in and... I was talking to a hit-and-run detective very recently about you. Um, talking about yeah, me? Yeah, about you. They asked well, after well, I, you. I taught the class at one point, was yeah. it? Well, it was, uh, you know, you'll know who it was um, when I tell this story. He asked me, how's Paul? I said, oh, he's good. You know, it's getting to be that season. Uh, where, you know, the weather's dark and Paul gets to do what he loves to do best, which is deal with hit and run investigations. So I guess you're getting excited to hear from him again. And he's like, well, the thing about Paul is he only ever gives us as much as we can already prove and nothing more. He's very good at sussing out exactly what we can prove and no more than that and then giving us that. So he boxes us into a corner and we know we can't get any more than than that from him so we're usually able to work something out with him that's favorable to his client well that all comes back to the trademark saying <laughs> mm -hmm. lawyer told me not to talk to you um the when i finally got that and i resolved it and i had worked that out to that point um i just found that it was so useful and hit and run investigations are one of those circumstances um, right, so don't destroy your car. Don't report it stolen. What about... Don't go get it repaired. Right. Uh, All of that could lead to a potential obstruction charge. Or more, or worse. There can be worse. Uh, and there's also charges under the Insurance Motor Vehicle Act, mm -hmm. uh, and charges under the Motor Vehicle Act, and, and the fact that you end up with no insurance. What so. about your obligations to ICBC? A lot of people think that if you're involved in an accident, you must report it to ICBC within 24 hours. Not true. Um, but really you should have Roy on for that part. So years ago, when I started as an impaired driving lawyer, um, we're talking 20 years ago now, working in the Sun Tower. It was a hot office back then, lots of good impaired driving lawyers, but we would meet with our clients and we would talk to them about their administrative driving prohibition. We'd say, oh, well, you know, the bad news is you're going to likely lose your ADP. I always looked at it and thought, I'm going to fight the ADP, but that was what lawyers were telling people at the time. And the good news is, well, I'll probably beat your criminal charge. And as far as the ICBC part is concerned, you're going to have to go find a civil lawyer. So we'd shuffle them down the hallway, our clients. Uh, we'd defend their criminal charge. We'd defend their ADP. I started defending the ADPs. Not a lot of lawyers were doing it. I started defending more ADPs. Most lawyers were saying, forget the ADP. Let's focus on the criminal charge. Um, but... Um, I kept looking at my clients going out the hallway and thinking to myself, I, I, there's nowhere, there's no lawyers who do it. 
There's nowhere I can send them. There's nobody who wants to do it. And I cannot just leave them in the lurch like this. So I started defending them with um, ICBC and dealing with the ICBC aspect. And I did okay. I got coverage on a number of cases, but I always felt amateurish. And so I, when Roy came along, Roy Ho, I got Roy involved in it. Um, the answer about reporting it to ICBC is talk to your lawyer first. ICBC is not going to find you in breach because you late reported. If they're going to find you in breach for something, it's probably the hit and run. That's an automatic breach. Um, but they, this, there's occasions that they can't find you an automatic breach for the hit and run. Sometimes you don't know what you hit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't know that you hit anything. They're, you know, they still have to put the get together their file. Um, and a lot of people think that ICBC and the police are just going to share all the doc, everything that they've got, that the adjuster from ICBC is phoning up the police officer and they're going, yeah, yeah, this is what we're going to do. Uh-uh, they're not talking. So ICBC, there's, there's strict limits on the information that they get. Um, and uh, don't assume that just because there's uh, police involved in a hit-and-run investigation that ICBC is going to be able to easily walk away from the insurance contract and leave you on the hook for all the damage. Okay. So uh, if you say something false to ICBC after you've been involved in a hit-and-run, how does that impact you? Well, that's the other thing. So that's why you don't want to report it to ICBC and you're better off to let your lawyer report it because we've been through this before as well. And that is there are limits to um, what the statements of your lawyer makes to ICBC, limits to how they can be used. And I have been involved in a case where a lawyer uh, made a statement to ICBC and that lawyer uh, then was involved in uh, defending the individual who had been charged with making false statements, subsequent statements to ICBC in the course of the investigation. And part of the way that they were trying to prove it was based on what the lawyer had initially said, which had been contradicted by other evidence that came out. And their whole strategy was that they were going to use this lawyer's statement. Now, I eventually, when they got me involved, um, managed to persuade the Crown to drop those charges because they couldn't prove anything against the client on the basis of what the lawyer said. And the Crown's position initially was, well, if I, you know, if I were uh, a lawyer I, uh, on, acting on something like this, I wouldn't give a statement to ICBC unless I was instructed by my client to say that. I said, yes, but you have to account for the possibility that the lawyer was mistaken about certain details in their instructions. And if you don't know how uh, accurately the lawyer understood the information, how can you base a false statement charge by, uh, on something that came through the lawyer? Well, it's also like hearsay through the lawyer. Yeah. And then their strategy also involved calling the lawyer to confirm that he was retained and given instructions to report it and that the that he reported it pursuant to his instructions, to which I uh, uh, responded, that would all be privileged. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You cannot compel a lawyer in those circumstances to say anything, which brings us right back to why you have a lawyer in the hit and run investigation. Yes. The film was uh, The Player, 1992, with uh, a Robert Altman film with Tim Robbins and um, Fred Ward and Whoopi Goldberg oh, and Whoopi. others. Okay. Um, all right. So if you are listening to this podcast, having freshly committed a hit and run, don't do anything other than lock your door and turn off your phone. And if your friend calls you and says, oh, man, I just did this, say, don't say anything else to me. I don't want to know. Phone a lawyer. And if you are thinking that your friend needs a lawyer for a hit and run, do not phone the lawyer for your friend. No, never do that. Um, and um, Get your friend to call us. Just persuade them. Don't start conspiring with your friend to come up with a story. Just talk no. to the lawyer. Say Just tell your look, friend to call a lawyer. I listen to this great podcast. Call this lawyer. They'll talk to you about it. And then uh, after uh, we've talked to you or your friend or whoever is involved in the hit and run, we will say at the end, by the way, don't forget, the lawyer told me not to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, moving on. 
from that great hit and run advice that everybody needs to know this rainy, wet, dark time of year where you might accidentally hit something or not realize you hit something. It's hard to see. I got older. I can't see as well as I used to. Yeah, I get it. I hear you. Um, but moving on from that, we did say this was the election special. Election special. Election so special. I, I want to go back to 2008. Okay, we're going back in time. When Paul goes back to 2008, I lean back in my chair because it's going to be a long time that he's going to talk. The reason I want to go back to 2008 is because the Conservatives introduced a piece of legislation then called Bill C-2 in their mandate, and it came into effect July 1st, 2008. And when it was introduced, uh, it was something that had been talked about many times before, had been rejected as private members' bills. Everybody thought it was stupid. We mock the conservatives for being hillbillies who didn't understand the science and behind impaired driving and the way that um, breathalyzers function and the, and the uh, effect of alcohol on the human body and the potential for failures in breath testing equipment. Um, and they eliminated what was called evidence to the contrary. Now, evidence to the contrary was widely mocked, particularly in Ontario, where it was called the two beers defense. People would come along. Uh, they would testify about what they had to drink. If their theoretical blood alcohol concentration was under 80 milligrams at the time of driving, they would be acquitted. I had two beers, man. Exactly. No, it, was, it would depend on how they said man. Oh, yeah, yeah. If they said, man, I just had two beers, then they were probably guilty. But if they said, oh, man, I just had two beers, then they were probably innocent. And that highlights something um, that arises from a case called WD. So... The WD case uh, complicated things for the two beer defense because basically the judge um, had instructions from the Supreme Court of Canada on how to weigh evidence. And if the judge couldn't come to a good conclusion, they would have to uh, acquit the person uh, because they had raised a um, evidence of the contrary um, argument. Now that con was what considered... Does all of this? That was the conservatives. So how were they for driving law? <clears throat> Thumbs down. Okay. This is, this is your point. Which brings us along to now we have another government changing Good impaired Lord. driving law. Good and Lord. you worse. went to the, you spoke worse. to the Senate. This is worse than You C2. spoke to the, it is worse. You spoke to the Senate, the House of Commons. You had uh, a senator, a conservative senator agreeing with you all the way along. They changed the law. Then they changed it back. Mm -hmm. But of course, there was lots of things that were just stupid in there. And liberals voted <clears throat> overwhelmingly in support of it. Oh, I know. And it was, again, something that had been had been the brought whole forward. The Trudeau, <clears throat> like, vote your conscience thing never really <clears throat> happened, hey? For his, his well, legislation. Well, the problem was that everybody went along with Jody Wilson-Raybould on this. And this was her thing. You can't vote in favor and of drunk she's, drivers. And You're she's, either with us or with the child uh, pornographers. She's, exactly. Um, which was Vic Taves as Justice Minister under the Conservatives. I know. So then we had um, independent Jody Wilson-Raybould who introduced this terrible legislation. And we could probably sit here and give a... What are you doing, Kyla? I'm playing with something. We could probably sit here and give a list of bad legislation that she introduced. But we've already done that. Kyla's written about it. Mm -hmm. um, but in any event, so the election special um, for driving. Our question. Our question to each other today was... What party will be best for driving law? And our answer? Well, so the Green uh, Party? <laughs> the Green Party? No. I no, mean, they're obviously, gonna... they're going to be the, they're the worst. They could legislate the uh, 50 kilometer an hour speed limit. Sure. Um, 80 kilometer an hour speed limit on the highways. I mean, the Green Party is going to do things that are aimed at reducing emissions mm. and imposing higher carbon taxes, which is going to disproportionately affect drivers because drivers produce large amounts of emissions and pay more in carbon taxes when they fill up their cars. See, I'm supportive of a carbon tax to reduce people from I'm not saying, driving. Them. I'm not saying that I'm not supportive of a carbon tax. What I'm saying is that if you're looking at the interests of drivers, which is, you know, the Driving Law podcast is about how law affects drivers or driving, um, the interests of drivers are not going to be protected by the Green Party. Well, they might protect the interest of drivers driving electric cars. So electric cars have thrown a wrench in the anti-car uh, lobby because it used to be very easy to argue, well, we should have nothing but transit going all the way down. We should eliminate highway, the highway one to here in Chilliwack. It should just be a bunch of trains 
running up and down and now you know it's uh 10 percent of the cars look like they're teslas and it could be five years from now 50 percent of the cars are electric okay. um so the green party i think will still be the worst for drivers when it comes to making it expensive to drive and they're not going to pass any criminal justice reform or anything like that that's going to help drivers now tell me will the ndp um, repeal the drunk driving laws that were introduced by Jody Wilson-Raybould. What do you think? You know, nobody's ever asked them, but I would, I would highly doubt it. And the reason I would highly doubt it is, again, this fear that politicians have about being perceived to be on the side of impaired drivers. I would say, though, that I do take some comfort in Jagmeet Singh's repeated statements that he is interested in evidence-based policy decisions. And there is no evidence to support that any of the cannabis-impaired driving measures enacted by Parliament as part of C-46 are going to save any lives or cut down on drug-impaired driving or even detect people who are impaired by drugs. Oh, but hang on, Kyla. Mm -hmm. The federal liberals made that same argument and in with it, respect to everything except the justice file, they did really rely on evidence-based conclusions over the last four years. But it's we the... know that they've sold drivers down the river. Oh, they did, for sure. I mean, but again, I, I think you have to separate Jody Wilson-Raybould from the rest of the liberals. Well, she separated herself. <clears throat> so. In the end, she separated herself. Um, but... but I don't, you know, when she got kick, kicked out of the uh, party and when... You know, when all that drama happened, it's not like the Liberals, the new Justice Minister, David Lametti, turned around and said, you know what, we let some pretty shitty things happen under her, and we're about to set that right. Well, he you know, did fix some things, like, within they're weeks. They're still in court. I'm up against them in court currently, where they're defending those laws. They let the assisted dying case go to the, go to decision in court, and be found unconstitutional. Now, they're not appealing that, thankfully, but still. Well, I mean, that's a good decision, though, right? They've looked at it. They've said, okay, we're not going to appeal this. This was a mistake that we made. Uh, and they, they had no choice. But hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Well, yeah, I know, but there, there can be reasons for that. So let's stop and think about the decision to not appeal and why you would do it, okay? You're going to pass a piece of legislation that you know is barely going to pass. And... You're looking at it and saying to yourself, you know what, the court's going to fix that one little thing that's going to keep us from passing it. And this is an important thing, assisted dying. So you think that... <clears throat> so it could have been strategic. If I'm, if I'm successful in my charter challenges <clears throat> to uh, saliva testing and to random breath testing, that as a result of the success in those challenges, I am going to... Are the, the government's not going to appeal? They're just going to leave it? Random breath testing. I think they could walk away from that one. I do not. I will I will bet you on this podcast. This is our second public podcast bet, if you take it. Um, I already offered you a $1,000 bet today, and you wouldn't take it. Yeah, that was for an NDP majority. I'm not an idiot. Look, I lost a $1,000 bet to you already, okay? I want to collect. I All want right. that money back. All right, $1,000, they won't walk away from it, and they'll appeal it. No, I will not take that bet. <laughs> I'll bet you a Coke. I'll bet you the Mr. Burns and Smithers uh, bet. A Coke. Oh. Um, I think that... Um, Any I... Coke? Oh, don't start playing lawyer with me. Can of Coke. A, a 355 can... milliliter can of Coke. Of a Coca-Cola product. A Diet Coke then. No, can I have just a Coca-Cola No, product? no, no, no. You're so trying to trick me. You're 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 trying to trick me. This is just how you <laughs> negotiated your wage early on as an articled student. And... Damn it. Yeah. Okay. I learned my lesson. Fine. A can of Diet Coke from the 7-Eleven. Or wherever I happen to buy it. Maybe one that's rolling around in the trunk of my car. You can't. No, it has to be a newly purchased can of Diet Coke. Whatever. Let's stop. Okay. This is the Driving Law Podcast, not the Coke Bet con Podcast. All right. Fine. Don't take the... Yeah, take the bet. Oh, so I already did. I don't, I don't think the liberals are going to be any good. I don't think the conservatives are going to be any good either. And in fact... Work that has been done since Humboldt 
is being undone by conservatives in this country. We, we've seen in Alberta the uh, Jason Kenney walking back the training requirements that they were on the way to impose for professional drivers so that we didn't see Humboldt-like shit happening again. And I think the federal conservatives as well would walk back those types of requirements at the federal level. So you think the federal conservatives are probably the, I mean, we talked about the federal requirements for professional drivers before, mm -hmm. but you think the federal conservatives will do the same thing, obviously, yep. because Jason Kenney is telling them what to do in any event, which is Stephen Harper and Preston Manning telling them what to do. Yep. So that's what they will do. So that's true. So you could argue that the conservatives are the worst choice in the driving law world. And then we have... For the protection of the public. The People's Party. Oh, I forgot about them. Yeah, right. Well, on the block, I guess we got to talk about the, <laughs> block, the block too. Uh, je ne sais pas. Well, about the block, the block, <laughs> the block are, are happy to form a. Uh, they'll do anything. They'll form a. They'll form a um, a government, a coalition government with the conservatives or the NDP, and the. And you as know. far as whatever they do, as long as it does not hurt the interests of Quebec, they'll go along with it. I have. So um, I don't think they're any good for drivers because I think drivers are just not on their radar. No, I mean, people in Quebec, they, they, they like to drive. They like to drive fast. They like to drive fast in cars that are, you know, with lots of rust on them. J'aime beaucoup. I don't think they will do anything They'll to do it. nothing. They'll do nothing. Um, but yes, I suppose theoretically the conservatives could be the worst because those professional drivers who are out there on the road who are not properly trained or who could have better mm -hmm. training that may lead to averting a Humboldt-like disaster um, will not have that training. So, so we have, really what we have is the Forget block. the Greens. Greens are out. Yeah. Greens are out. Liberals are out because they betrayed us. Well, no. No, no. Hang on. That's Jody Wilson's Betrayal. out. She's done. So. Liberals are questionable. Jody Wilson is running on her own, so she's out. <laughs> yeah. Um, liberals questionable. Yeah. Conservatives out. And the NDP aren't going to do anything for us. I know you're NDP supporter, but they're not going to do anything PPC for us. is the wild card? Or are we like you know what? They, as driving law podcast endorsing the People's Party? Because I'm oh not God. on board hang for on, that. Hang on a second. <laughs> because the People's Party are you know, probably going to, I know, are probably going to be looking at raising the speed limits wherever mm -hmm. they can. Mm -hmm. So national parks, 120 kilometers an hour, um, if that's what you like as a driver. Um Probably less regulation overall, if that's what you like as a driver. Sure. Um, and um, maybe they won't uh, allow driver's license to new immigrants. Um, maybe that's what you also want. I don't know. If that's what you like as a driver? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just trying to, you know, lay out what I think they would do. Because, you know. Yeah. So... <laughs> So, so I, there you go. But I can't endorse them. No. Um, so I'm not endorsing any party here. Look, in the same in the same way that you, well, it kind of sounds like you're endorsing the liberals because you're like, not willing to admit that they betrayed us. Well, of course they betrayed us. They betrayed yeah. people on all sorts of things. But Betrayal. of course I expect that. Betrayal. That's, they got that's my a, strategic boat and they betrayed me. First past the post, that was the... I, I, the problem is, I don't think it was a betrayal. I think it was just stupidity. I think that a lot of them probably thought they could do that. They can't do it. The NDP blocked it. The conservatives blocked it. The proposal that was made, it was never going to go anywhere. Do so what? it's never going to happen. First past the post. I don't, I don't care about electoral reform. I actually, I might, I, I like it the way it is. Do you? Um, I do. Yeah. Uh, you know how I feel about change. I still think that <laughs> they should, I still think they should have to get into a ring and beat each other up. No, I... And that would be a liberal thing, right? Well, Andrew Shear would just not survive more than a minute. Jagmeet Singh would win that fight. He probably could do not bad. He'd probably do very well. Yeah. I, um, I think Elizabeth May actually could come out on top. She she's bite. tough. Yeah. She, no, she's tough. She's tough. <laughs> okay. This Maxime Bernier would be wiped. <laughs> this conversation is devolving. The point is that if you're thinking about your interests as a driver when you're going to cast your ballot on Monday... Remember that there is really no clear choice for you. And but I, so... I, I still think you can avoid the conservatives because of the safety issue in the Humboldt. And yeah. So I think that's probably, and you probably could also, and I'm not encouraging you not to vote green. Um, you could also probably say, yeah, I'm not going to vote green because I know that as a driver, it's going to become that much more expensive. Uh, and they will do everything. And you. they will do everything to d discourage you from being on the road. And 
um, probably don't vote block because the majority of our listeners are in British Columbia, and I'm not sure how many candidates the block is running here. I don't think the block's running any. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I was gonna, if I was gonna run for a party, that would be it. The block Quebecois candidate yeah. in British Columbia. The only <laughs> candidate in British Columbia. <laughs> okay. Bonjour. So, election special. My message to everybody. Um, given that we have no clear consensus of who's... Well, we're not, we're not recommending drivers. anybody, but get yeah. out and vote. My message is vote your conscience. My message is get out and vote strategically. Well, whatever, your strate- <laughs> whatever your strategy happens to be. Conscience. Strategy. <laughs> and just vote. Vote in the federal election and more importantly for the lawyers who are listening. Yes, more, more importantly, importantly. More importantly. Oh my God. <laughs> vote in the Law Society of BC election because your vote really does have a huge impact in the Law Society of British Columbia election. Do we have a ridiculous driver of the week? We do have a ridiculous driver of the week. It is a woman in Oakville, Ontario. You can find the video online. She I, I saw it on Globals. caught on dash cam, um, hanging on to the spoiler on the back of it. looks like an old, like, Toyota Supra or something. Um, hanging on to that, whipping down the highway with roller skates on. Maybe roller blades. Maybe, but just a sweet time. Yep. Um, <laughs> it's the type of thing that you could only persuade yourself to do after uh, drinking, I would think. Yes. Um, and, um, I, would, I would tell you that I know people who have done this, and I know people... Done this? Yes. Roller skates, roller blades? Oh, having people hanging off various portions of the vehicle. Oh, yeah. And you will end up with a dangerous driving charge if you are the driver of that vehicle. So don't do it. Don't let someone do it. I'm just amazed. Well, you know, in Edmonton growing up, I remember we used to watch ETS, Edmonton Transit System, buses every once in a while. People would like hang on the back of the bus when the roads were just solid snow packed and sort of go skating behind it. It looked like a lot of fun when I was a kid. I thought... Maybe when I get, I'm a teenager, I'll try that. Um, I would imagine that that's extremely dangerous when the bus hits the brakes or you let go and hit a post. So don't do it because you will die. But the, um, the ridiculous driver of the week is certainly the driver who agrees to do that and the person who is out there doing it. For sure. So that is our message for this week. The election special, special, special. <laughs> We spoke of two elections. Yes, and if you like our content, uh, you'll find a new episode of Driving Law every Friday. And if you like our content, you can also find all sorts of other content we create online at VancouverCriminalLaw.com or uh, give us a phone call, 604-685-8889. That message goes out to you, person who has freshly hit and ran, 604-685-8889. Tune in next week for another episode of Driving Law. (laughs) 